Hello, and greetings to all you fans of RPGs and of Dungeons and Dragons. This is RPG Mods Fan, and in this walkthrough video, I will be reviewing and discussing the Dungeons and Dragons module L3 Deep Dwarven Delve, which credits Len Lakovka as its author. Ooh, there is quite a bit of goblinoid activity by that hill I see before me. This must be it. This must be the Orc's Lair. And this must be where the goblinoid raiders are operating out of. Hopefully, I can get back to the town of Restenford without being spotted. The L3 Deep Dwarven Delve module was published by Wizards of the Coast in 1999. This module was meant for player characters between the levels of 3 to 6. This was written for AD&D 1st Edition rules. The Dungeon Master will need to do some work to convert it to 5th Edition rules. The module's teaser reads as follows. Your party of stalwart heroes must venture into a lost dwarven mining complex, fighting terrible monsters, bypassing deadly traps, and exploring chambers heavy with dust of ages. Somewhere deep below the surface lies the heart of darkness, a corrupting evil that must be stopped before its influence can spread. The L3 Deep Dwarven Delve module is a sequel to the L1 The Secret of Bone Hill and L2 The Assassin's Knot modules and it was intended as the final adventure in the L series, which is also known as the Lendor Isle series. On my channel, I have already reviewed the L1, The Secret of Bone Hill, and L2, The Assassin's Knot modules. In those videos, I give some background on the publishing history of the L series. Links to the videos will be in the description section below. Both the L1 and L2 modules were written by the late, great Len Lakovka. Due to various issues and the turmoil at TSR, the third module in the series was finally published by Wizards of the Coast almost two decades after the first two. Len Lakovka's original version of the L3 module was either lost or destroyed. The developers at Wizards of the Coast then wrote and published their version of the L3 module and credited Len Lakovka as the author. The L3 module was published in August of 1999 as bonus material in the Silver Anniversary Collector's Edition boxed set, which included quite a few classic AD&D modules. In 2009 and 2013, Len Lakovka released the fourth and fifth installments of the Lendor Isles series on the dragonsfoot.org's website as free downloads. The funny thing is, the L4 module says it can be used as a sequel to the L1 and L2 modules. However, it makes no mention or acknowledgement of the L3 module. Hmm. Officially, the Lendor Isles were placed southeast of the Flanas continent in the world of Greyhawk. Since the Lendor Isles is a set of islands, it should be relatively easy to place it in most campaign worlds. The adventure starts as follows. For some months, marauding orcs and other goblinoids have been attacking the small towns of Restenford and Lake Farman. Three days ago, a group of well-organized and equipped orcs, bugbears, and ogres attacked Restenford. Several soldiers were killed, and more than a dozen were wounded. In the fighting, the town hall was put to the torch. The townsfolk watched in horror as the structure burned, presumably killing everyone inside. Eventually, the goblinoids were driven off just before dawn. 
One member of the militia, a ranger, tracked the goblinoids back to their lair. Unfortunately, the creatures spotted the ranger and fired at her with their crossbows. Despite being injured, she managed to return to Lake Farman and report on the location of the raider's lair. The town councils of Rustenford and Lake Farman have put out a call for help to the surrounding lands. Will your group of hardy adventurers answer their call for help? I find one major problem with this beginning. It is almost as if the module assumes the player characters have not played through the L1 and L2 modules. If they have, then their characters should already be in either Restonford or Lake Farman. By the way, the town of Lake Farman is also known as the town of Garotten. Here is how I would fix that. After concluding the L2 module, ask your players what do their characters do for the next few months. Try to accommodate them as best as possible. Then mention that both towns are intermittently being raided by goblinoids. Play out one or more of these raids as a combat encounter with your players. Then the local rulers call for aid from the adventurers. Say that the rulers want the adventurers to travel to a far-off area to see if the goblinoids are operating out of that area. When the player characters go there, they will find nothing. When they return, they will then learn that Restonford was attacked. If the player characters left any valuable items behind in Restonford, you can say that the attackers have stolen those items. Then play out the module as intended. I am the evil that lies deep within the deep dwarven delve, and my thrall RPG Modsphere will be discussing the module itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. You have been warned. <laughs> The Deep Dwarven Delve module is a straightforward dungeon crawl that leads the player characters through an abandoned dwarven mine, battling orcs, undead dwarves, and low-level devils. I would summarize the adventure as follows. 200 years ago, dwarves mining for Mithril accidentally tunneled into an ancient temple dedicated to the archdevil Balsabol. All the miners were slain, by a possessed iron golem. When the dwarven clan who sponsored the mining operations could not contact the miners, they then sent a war party to investigate. But they too were slain and lost. The dwarves then decided to abandon the mines and erase all written records of it. A band of orcs moved into the upper level of the abandoned mines. For the past few months, these orcs have been raiding the towns of Restonford and Lake Farman. Three days ago, an unusually well-organized group of goblinoids assaulted Restonford, killing and injuring townsfolk and burning down the town hall. A ranger tracked the assailants to their lair and reported back with their location. The town councils then put out a call for help. The player characters answer the call and enter the former mine. The layers of the mine is a dungeon crawl. They first fight a band of orcs as well as some other creatures. They then reach the lair where the ancient temple to Basable is located, which is home to more menacing monsters. The adventurers fight an iron golem and 200-year-old animated undead dwarves. 
The final boss battle is against a barred devil named Vesenor. However, killing Vesenor is not enough to end the threats. Within the evil temple is a gate to the Nine Hells. The adventurers manage to deactivate the gate, causing the dungeons to collapse. I will now discuss the module's timeline of events. My apologies in advance. I will be repeating quite a number of things I have already mentioned before. 200 years ago, dwarves were secretly mining a rich vein of mithril near the towns of Ressenford and Lake Farman, which is also called Garotten. The miners accidentally tunneled into an ancient temple dedicated to the archdevil Balsabal. All the dwarf miners were slain and animated into undead creatures. The dwarven clan sponsoring the mine sent a well-armed and experienced party to investigate and learn why contact with the miners was lost. These adventurers were also slain and lost. Unwilling to risk further losses or a chance of detection by the nearby towns, the dwarves decided to abandon the mine and destroy all records of its existence. Several months ago, a band of orcs, as well as bugbears, ogres, and several other monsters have made the upper level of the abandoned mine their lair. The abandoned mine has three levels and is referred to as the Delve. For the past few months, the orcs operating out of the Delve have been boldly raiding the towns of Restonford and Lake Farman. Three days ago, a group of well-organized and equipped orcs, bugbears, and ogres descended on Restonford and engaged in a pitch battle with its local militia, killing and injuring several townsfolk and burning down the town hall. A ranger tracked the assailants back to their lair, but she was spotted and badly injured in the process. The ranger managed to report back with their location. Now the town councils of Restonford and Lake Farman have put out a call for help to the surrounding lands. The player characters travel to Restonford to answer its call for help against the goblinoid raiders. The joint councils of both towns plead with the adventurers to end the threats quickly. The player characters travel to and enter the former Dwarven Mine, and on the Delve's first level, they encounter a band of orcs that layer there, as well as other creatures. Below the orc layer is an ancient temple that was dedicated to Balsabal, which is now home to even more menacing creatures, such as an iron golem and undead dwarves. The final boss battle is against a barred devil named Vesenor. However, killing Vesenor is not enough to end the threat. The adventurers reach the ancient temple of Balsabal, where there is a gate to the sixth layer of hell. They manage to deactivate the gate, but that causes the collapsing of the delve and the adventurers now need to run for their lives. The module has a few villains that it highlights, and other than their stats, it also provides some tactics to use for them. Enthar is a male human 6th level mage. If the alarm has been raised in the delve, Enthar will cast both enlarge and invisibility spells on the orc leader, Ogre, Bugbear, or Trill. All these creatures reside on the Delve's first level. Every time the player characters rest to recuperate spells and hit points, Enthar will collect any corpses left behind on level 1 of the Delve and teleport them to Frelpek, a dwarf cleric, on level 3. Frelpek is an insane male 8th level Dwarf Cleric. 200 years ago, Felprick was dissatisfied with his standing in the Dwarven community. 
he was easily corrupted into serving Belzebul. Felprick then constructed an iron golem that the dwarf miners thought was supposed to assist in the mining operations. Belzebul sent an evil spirit to possess the iron golem, and in one long bloody night, it killed all the miners. Frelpik has went insane since then. Some time later, Frelpik animated the corpses of many of his former companions and had them return to the work of mining Mithril. Every time the player characters rest to recuperate spells and hit points, Frelpik will cast Animate Dead on the corpses that Anthar has sent to him. Vesinor is a barred devil and is the final boss of the module. Vesinor is Balsable's agent. Like Frelpik, Vesinor can also cast Animate Dead. Thus, the number of zombies in the third level of the Dwelve can potentially swell. There are a few other villains in the module, such as a spirit Naga and a bone devil named Skirpus. However, unlike Anthar, Frelpik, and Vesinor, these villains do not have dynamic roles. I shall now go over the module's maps. The Delves complex itself is within a very large hill in a hilly area. From the outside and at ground level of the hill, the entrances into the Dwelve are well concealed. Displayed on the screen is level 1 of the Delve. Displayed now on the screen is the monster roster for this level. The Dungeon Master can adjust these numbers up or down depending on the strength of the adventurers. Keep in mind that if the alarm is raised, all these denizens will mount a defense and are not tied to their specific locations. The map is probably easier to decipher with the chambers labeled as they are now. On guard at the main entrance, which is labeled A on the map, are two to five orcs. Stationed at the rear entrance, which is labeled B on the map, are one to four orcs. Chamber number six is the prison and stables chamber. There are six horses tethered here. On the northeast wall is a secret door that Enthar uses. Guarding this room will be one to four normal orcs. In this room are also five manacled and chained prisoners. All of them are in a weakened state. Should the dungeon master wish, he or she can have Restenford's mayor as one of the prisoners here. Chamber number five serves as the orc's lair. The orc commander will be here along with one to four orc leaders and 13 to 28 normal orcs. Also here will be two to eight raiding party orcs on the north wall is a peephole which Anthar uses to spy in on events in this chamber. On the northwest wall is a secret door that likewise Anthar uses. Chamber number two serves as the barracks for the two bugbear denizens of the Delve. Stationed at chamber number one are two to twelve normal orcs. There is a 50% chance that an orc leader and a 15% chance that a bugbear will also be here. Chamber number three is the troll's lair. As a reminder, a troll regenerates three hit points per round, and their body must be burned or dissolved in acid in order to completely destroy it. There is a 20% chance that two to eight raiding party orcs will also be in this chamber. Chamber number seven is the treasure room. Only Enthar has the key to this locked room. There is quite a bit of coin here. But keep in mind, this money was stolen from the poor townsfolk of Restenford and Lake Farman. Iron golems can only be hit by magical weapons of plus three or greater enchantment. 
Thus, the magical weapons found here will be useless against it. Should the dungeon master wish, they can also add a holy gold chalice here that was stolen by the raiders from Ressenford's clerics. The DM can make this a quest item that the clerics want back. The chalice can give a cleric the ability to cast two additional Cure Light Wound spells each day. Chamber number 8 is the teleporter room. Anthar wears the ring that can activate the teleporter. The teleporter only works to cavern number 38 in the third level of the delve. Chamber number 4 serves as the lair for the Ogras. There is a 30% chance that Anthar will be here. If he is, then there will be 1 to 4 orc leaders accompanying him. Once the first level of the delve has been cleared of monsters, the adventurers can use this room to safely rest and recuperate. Set into the west wall is a secret door that hides the corridor beyond, which descends down to the second level of the delve. On the floor of the corridor are a pair of rusted rails. On one of the walls of the corridor, scratched in ancient dwarvish ruins, is the following warning. Curse the darkness that lies below, and all the horrors it hath spawned. Foe smiter tried, and foe smiter died. His foolish bravery has doomed us all. Displayed on the screen is level 2 of the delve. This level is musty and unused. The 1 cm thick layer of dust on the floor has not been disturbed for over 200 years. The tunnels and chambers were carved from seamless stone by the skilled dwarven miners. Displayed on the screen is the monster roster for this level. The Dungeon Master can adjust these numbers up or down depending on the strength of the adventurers. As before, this map is probably easier to decipher with the chambers labeled as they are now. Within chamber number 9 are unsalvageable digging equipment. There are 10 dwarf skeletons here who will attack anyone but dwarves. A 10-foot or 3-meter wide crevice bisects chamber number 11. The crevice is 60 feet or 18 meters deep. On the other side of the crevice, hiding behind a minecart, is a spirit naga. In the minecart is a plus 3 longsword which will be invaluable when fighting the iron golem on the third level. The sword is sentient, speaks, and calls itself Zalko. Also in the minecart are the Naga's treasure hoard, which includes coins, gems, and four spell scrolls. A rusted pair of rails that began beyond the secret door in chamber number four ends in this chamber, which is aptly named End of the Line. If Zalko is unsheathed and comes within five feet of the secret door on the south wall, it will alert the wielder of this fact. Chamber number 13 contains an underground spring and is flooded. The very middle of this corridor has a seesaw trap. The trap activates when there is much more weight on its western half than on its eastern half causing those on its western half to fall into a pit. I fell for fools, gold, I fell for fools, gold, what did I know, what did I know? At chamber number 15's northwest niche, the party will see a thick vein of gold. Eight mining picks stand alongside the walls of the niche. The vein of gold is, of course, an illusion. The module has the player characters rolling for saving throws. However, 
as a DM, I would first ask the player characters what do they do. If any of them say they ignore the gold or exit the room or such, then I would have those characters roll saving throws. Those that fail will pick up the picks and start mining. Before reaching chamber number 17, the player characters will hear a measured metallic ringing of blows being struck on an anvil. The chamber is a blacksmith area and the player characters will see a dwarf smith at work here, hammering on an axe on an anvil. Unless provoked, the smith will completely ignore the characters. The smith is actually a wraith. Wraiths can only be hit by silver or magical weapons. The walls of chamber number 18 have carvings depicting famous acts of ancient dwarven heroes. Sitting on a throne here is a real dwarf skeleton. In other words, it is inanimate and is not an undead creature. On its crushed skull is the dwarven helm of the master miner. The helm does have some benefits, but its major drawback is that it prohibits spellcasting by its wearer. And finally, we have reached the bottom and last level of the delve. Now displayed on the screen is the monster roster for this level. As before, the dungeon master can adjust these numbers up or down depending on the strength of the adventures. Also displayed are the chamber labels, which should make the map easier to decipher. I will now walk through the southern half of the level. Displayed on the screen are the percent chance Vesinor will be in a particular room. Chamber number 19 was once used as barracks by the Dwarven miners. Guarding this room are two Dwarven zombie fighters. The stairs descending corridor to the south has a rolling boulder trap. Chamber number 23, likewise, was once the barracks for the Dwarven miners. Guarding this room are three Dwarven zombie fighters and two Dwarven zombie clerics. Chamber number 20 is a weapons storage room. The room is guarded by two dwarven zombies. One is a fighter, the other is a cleric. If there are any dwarves or gnomes in the party, they will recognize airweed growing in chamber number 21. The plant is used to replenish the stale air in the deepest of mines. Chamber number 22 was once the feast hall for the miners. The room now has two zombie fighters and one zombie cleric. In my opinion, the writers of this module lazily named and described chamber number 25 as the mithril mine. Does this circular chamber look like a mine? My fix to this would be to have a circular pit in the center of the room. Down below would be the mine itself. Anyway, in this room are three zombie fighters. An iron door that is molded to the likeness of a dwarf bars the way into cavern number 26. The door has no lock. Regardless of how the door is opened, opening it has a 50% chance of summoning Vesinor into the cavern. Any living creature entering into the cavern will be illuminated with fairy fire and it is permanent until dispelled. There are three black puddings in area number 27. Each X marks the current location of one of them. Black puddings are nasty creatures. Their only true weakness is fire. Their corrosive saliva eats away metal. If it gets in contact with metal armor or weapons, such items will dissolve away. Magical enchantment only buys an additional round of survival for each level of enchantment. Enchantment? Enchantment! So, hitting a black pudding with a plus two sword 
will cause it to degrade into a plus one sword. Hitting it again causes the sword to lose its magical enchantment. Hitting it yet again causes the sword to dissolve away. Not to mention that each strike will divide the creature into two parts, with each part able to attack. Most all the rooms before this cavern were lit by multiple continual light spells. This was probably done so that the player characters will not have any lit torches when entering into this area. Yet, the module has this whole area under the effect of a continual darkness spell. Cavern number 28 is the garbage pit and has a horrible stench. In this cavern is an otio. Cavern number 29 is magically kept cold. There is a 50% chance that a minor villain named Skirpus will be here. Otherwise, he will be in the next cavern, which is cavern number 30, and is also freezing. Skirpus is a bone devil. Areas numbered 31 to 36 are the lower mines, and are inhabited by seven dwarven zombie cleric fighters. Cavern number 37 is Frelpik's study and workroom. Some of the valuable treasure found here include a rod of smiting, an onyx dog, and a ring of spell storing. If hard-pressed, Frelpik will make use of these items. Cavern number 38 is the destination of the teleporter from chamber number 8 on level 1 of the delve. The iron golem bars the exit from and the entry into this cavern. Old school D&D can be unnecessarily rough. Iron golems have a poisonous cloud breath weapon and in old school D&D, saving throws against poison are save or die. The only magical attack effective against an iron golem are electrical, which only slows it. Thus, spellcasters are practically useless against it. And, on top of all this, iron golems are invulnerable to weapons below plus three enchantments. So, hopefully your player characters will run away from this fight. Run away! Run away! And finally, we have reached the last room in this dungeon which is the Temple of Balzabal. Towards the west is an immense statue of the Archdevil. Its red gem eyes are worth 5,000 gold pieces each. If still alive, the Bard Devil, Vesenor, will be in this room. Likewise, if still alive, the Bone Devil, Skirpus, will be in this room. If neither are alive, and a player character tries to remove the red gem eyes, a bone devil will be summoned into the room, demanding one of the player characters to be sacrificed. On the floor towards the east part of the room is a gate to the sixth layer of hell. It is masked by an illusion to make it appear as a normal floor. Removing the red gem eyes will deactivate the gate. In addition, when both gems are removed, 10 minutes later, the entire area shudders violently. The delve begins to collapse, starting with chamber number 39, and sequentially destroying each previous area in turn. Player characters must now run for their lives and will not have time to rest, collect chunks of mithril, loot dead enemies, and so forth. Deactivating the gate causes the temple and the delve to be destroyed, and puts an end to the threat Bazabal posed to the region. Well, at least for the time being. Upon returning to Ressenford or Lake Farman, the adventurers are treated like heroes. And so concludes the L3 
Deep Dwarven Delve module. Roll credits. Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. This module comes close to being a monster condo. If not, then it definitely is a dungeon crawl. The one thing that needs improvement are the maps. It is very hard to decipher where the secret doors are from the module's maps. I like the plot and story elements of the module. However, what stops me from saying this is a good or great module is the map design of its dungeons. The dungeon design lacks branching paths, which makes this module a railroad adventure. If you have any ideas on how to make this module even better, please share them in the comments below. Hello again, Huyar and Kuot here. Hope you enjoyed RPG Mods fans walkthrough, review and discussion of the L3 Deep Dwarven Delve module. Time for Kuot and I to leave. Take care and hope to see you again. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. Please subscribe, like, share and comment. I do like feedback and I try to respond to as many comments as I can. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. Mind's going in circles, I'm trying to fight it Get in these voices inside to stay quiet Go to the place where all this began Just start again Oh, you won't see the light until the dawn breaks No, till it's all said and done You won't know what it takes I'm trying to hide it Get in these voices